Yeah. Let me hear you take that. That he's gonna Where are you gonna be? Where are you going? I know, I know. Are you up? Dr. Dirk, thanks for coming. Yeah, perfect. Okay, but um, so let me get to do this. We use this. How do we get them up? No, she, no she's no, going no, to I put it right up. You take care of that. I watch you Super. Guys. This is your laser. And does the lab work? Okay, great. <laughs> yeah. And she'll come in if we need it. Yep. Pointer. Yep, yep, we got it. Yes. Don't touch these. I know. The They're standard. standard. You got a pointer on there? Huh. Yep. Yeah. Middle? No, top. Top. Okay. Middle usually does pointer. And in advance is yeah. the right and left. Wise man once told me, you need to use a pointer, your slides are not where they should be. Is Fee going to come talk? Is Fee opening his own? He's opening. You start, man. Where's my other there? Can I mention our sponsor? Yeah. Even so, though we don't have any banners. I told you we could put banners up there. Yeah, it's, it's got into too much of a hassle with the. <laughs> all right, good morning, everyone. Are we all situated and acclimated, it's not raining or snowing or doing anything else that it's not supposed to do today. So <laughs> welcome everyone to this phenomenal facility and, and thank you so much for being here. Um, I know it's a Saturday morning that could be spent doing a lot of other things versus being educated about scleroderma and some of its nuances, but I guarantee you we've got a lineup that is just phenomenal. Um, this is our flagship team, if you will, and they're very kind to put on this event for us. And we're glad to tag along, if you will, as the Scleroderma Foundation. My name is Fee Sapahi. I'm the executive director of the Delaware Valley chapter. And I just want to take a minute to thank the staff uh, who put this all together, helped put this all together, along with Matt, who's sitting up there on a step, uh, helped us coordinate this event, and obviously all the physicians who are here to present to you today. Um, Thanks to the volunteers for being here and the board members of the Delaware Valley chapter. I know there's a handful of you in the room. Would you raise your hand if you're a board member? Joyce Roby Washington and Lainey Blodgett uh, over there. So uh, thank you all for being here. I also wanted to thank our sponsors who helped provide funding for this event, which are Actilian, Bayer, and Riata. And um, we couldn't do these events without their uh, input, if you will. Uh, I also wanted to let you know about the events. There's event calendars out there with all the events that are going on around the chapter. We have a walk coming up in Atlanta here pretty shortly, a golf outing. So if you're looking for something fun to do, join us at one of these events. And for sure, become a member of the chapter for $25 a year. You can get national news, you can get local news, and you can get invited to all these events. So without taking any more of your time, I'm going to introduce to you Dr. Peter Merkel, who's going to give start us off on a day and introduce all of our speakers. Thank you. First of all, I'm cleaning up because I've got to keep Penn neat. Um, I, uh, I want to th welcome you all to uh, University of Pennsylvania and our scleroderma program. It's uh, great to see a nice crowd. And thank you, Fee. Um, I want to just before I even start reemphasize how important it is to be a member of the Scleroderma Foundation. This is the patient advocacy group for patients with scleroderma and has a tremendous impact on the lives of patients with scleroderma, research that is done in scleroderma. It's very supportive 
and the direction that things happen in this country in scleroderma. And some of us are old enough to remember when there was more than one group and it was a little bit confusing and people got together and I think people realized that uh, there is force in numbers of people together uh, working for scleroderma. And I think when patients approach us, when they have this new and confusing and often very scary disease, say, how can I get information? And what they want is they want information from us in the white coats, but they also want information from their fellow patients. They want reliable information, because you can go on the web and get, oh, lots of different kinds of information, some of which is very useful and reliable, and some of which is uh, a little bit out there. And I think they know that the Scleroderma Foundation is a very reliable source of vetted, important information. So I, I would encourage you to stay active in the uh, program, uh, both locally and nationally, because it's really an important important group. Uh, we are delighted to uh, host this event and happy to do it in the past and hopefully in the future. The scleroderma program continues to grow and I'll show you a little bit about that here at Penn. You are actually around the corner from where I see patients and where Dr. Sandorfi and Dork and K uh, Dirk and Kaywood and others. <laughs> he's a bit of a dork but he's actually our Dirk. <laughs> aren't, aren't we all? <laughs> so um, and uh, he, um, I won't even tell you, I, I, won't, I won't even tell you what we talk about Sandorfi behind her back, but that's another, that's another thing. So um, we actually write down, uh, when you go down, there's a big coffee kiosk behind that, is actually, and it's not by accident, a combined clinic of rheumatology appropriately in the middle, and then pulmonary to one side and dermatology, and actually right below us, one floor down, is our pulmonary function testing, echocardia, or cardiogram and x-rays and CT. So we actually like that it's all in one place. And we, are begin we work closely together with one another on these different things, and I'll show you both in the research, but clinically. And I think that's what you want, whether you come to Penn or you go to any other center, what you want is a coordinated care, because this is a complicated disease, and you need people who know it and see it. So we're delighted to work together and to do that. I'm going to, um, I, I'm, so I'm the chief of rheumatology here, and I've been doing scleroderma research for over 20 years. Uh, and Delighted to be part. I'll introduce each speaker either maybe at the end of my thing or then as we go along uh, because you have some uh, significant experts here. So let me tell you about clinical research at Penn. I'll be fairly brief of in, in scleroderma because it sets us up. It's, it's both to tell you what's available in case you're interested and also to give you a sense of what's happening on the national and international front because it's exciting to see this kind of research being done. Uh, first of all, uh, what type of studies? I've shown this before. We have observational studies. We follow people over time. Some of you are in those. We have data analysis. We have a lot of data that we work with and able to understand more. So we actually think every patient in every trial is contributing very valuable information, and we should use as much of it as possible because it's not a common disease, and so we want to get as much out of it we can. Therapeutic clinical trials, new drugs, new treatments. We've got a bunch of those to show you. Biomarker studies. Wouldn't it be nice to have a blood test that could tell us, we actually have some already, you're more likely to get this, but you're not going to get that, and when is the treatment going to work, when is treatment not working, what can we do, when can we stop, when can we start stuff. We'd love to have those. Our focus, we focus on all aspects of the disease. We look at skin disease, we, look at, we have research in lung disease, both pulmonary hypertension and interstitial lung, I'll explain a little about that. Dr. K will hopefully explain a lot more about that. Um, we, we look at Raynaud's phenomena and digital ulcers, we've been doing work on that in quite a while. And then the overall disease, and as I said, outcome measures, how do you measure the disease and biomarkers. So we're also looking at some genetics of the disease, and I'll tell you quickly about each of these exciting research ideas, because we would like to not be here in a couple of decades. We'd like to, I think that our goal is better treatment, better quality of life, and I don't think, it's, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying we'd like a cure. And so, because we, we can do other things. And there are other diseases we could treat. So I think we should uh, raise the bar high. The, I think we will find more and more effective treatments for scleroderma, and I think we will be successful in doing that in the next several years. I'm certainly hopeful of that. I think we're getting there, and we've gotten some better treatments along the way since I've been doing this. So what about skin disease and scleroderma? Obviously, it's sort of the, the one people think about always the most, but it's not always the biggest problem, but it is a big problem in scleroderma. So uh, Dr. Dirk is leading uh, a trial just down here at Penn of a drug called ambrosentin, which is actually Dr. K. uses for people with lung disease, looking at the treatment of skin disease. This was to see if it actually will help them, patients with skin disease, on top of additional therapy. And it's, I won't get into the complex design because it's actually already fully recruited, and he is now following up and finishing it up within the next 18 months, perhaps, Dr. Dirk, is that right? 
The last patient finished, and now it's data analysis and everything, and his friends in the room will push him to get that going and written up by this afternoon. Uh, no, it should take several months, actually, to do this analysis and get it going. And uh, this is a pilot study to get a sense, is this drug promising? Can we move forward on it? And this is something that Dr. Dirk has developed and done fully um, and has done well. On a larger scale study, we're part of the ASSET study. Dr. Sandorfi is the lead investigator at the University of Pennsylvania. This is using a drug called abatacept, which is Rencia. It's used in rheumatoid arthritis. I won't get into the science of it, but it affects T cells. It's a very interesting drug. It appears to be a very safe drug in the treatment patients we've treated in. And this is a big multicenter, meaning there are 30 or so centers around the world, placebo-controlled, double-blind study, meaning that you randomize, you either get the drug or you get a placebo, a, a fake drug, and it's the, it's the sort of the best way to do these trials to get a sense if you can have an answer. And patients either get the active drug or they get a placebo, and the reason we feel that's comfortable because we don't have highly effective or, or obviously effective therapy for skin, we've got to find some new ones. And so that study is now open here. We have patients enrolled in that study, and we're always looking for more. So it's patients with diffuse disease, um, so skin disease, and if you think you might be eligible, let us know, and we can certainly screen you possibly for be part of this study. Uh, the STAR study, this is a really interesting study. Um, are we still recruiting in the STAR? No, that closed. So we recruited some patients. This is a study you want to know about because it's just very interesting. So this is, I won't get into, it's, it's complicated even for us. Adipose-derived regenerative stem cells. So what does this mean? So this is, uh, Dr. Dirk led on this with Dr. Scott Levin, who is a orthopedic and plastic surgeon, and you'll understand why we need that in a second. So what this study does is it's taking through liposuction. So come to the scleroderma center, you'll get thinner and you get research. But um, so we do, so Dr. Levin, they sucked out fat cells, put it into this machine, I kid you not, it is, goes into this magic machine and it derives, it takes out these, these very, very interesting cells that can grow into other cells. They're processed, all happens in one day. Go to surgery, you get the cells processed, and then they're injected back into the hand of patients who have scleroderma and have trouble closing their hands and opening their hands. And you get it, either you get your, your own cells back or you get a placebo injection. And this has actually happened around the country. I forget how many total number of patients are there. 80 patients, so not a big number. It took a lot of centers. I can tell you, to get the patients, it took enormous amount of work for Dr. Dirk and the team to set up to do this, because you have to coordinate the surgery and everything. But it's an interesting study to see if these will then grow and help with the fibrosis and make people flexible. Does it sound wild? It's a bit wild. There's some preliminary data that says it's safe to do this, and we're very interested to see. So it's a good example of the scleroderma research community going in new directions, saying, okay, can we change what's happening in the patient's body. So we look forward to see what will happen with that. But that was a nice example of what we do, I think, quite well at Penn, which is coordinate among different departments and work together. <laughs> what about lung disease? You're going to hear more about lung disease, at least one part of it from Dr. Kaywood. This is a major center for study and treatment of interstitial lung disease, which is the fibrosis and inflammation in the lungs, and pulmonary arterial hypertension, which is fix the arteries, high pressure in the lungs, and you're going to hear more about that. Uh, we have big programs in both of that, by, led by the pulmonary department. Dr. Kaywood runs the pulmonary arterial hypertension program, and we're doing research in this. Um, one is a clinical trial that Dr. Rossman, who's another pulmonologist, leading with Dr. Sandorfi for rheumatology, and this is a new drug. It's a pill. So we like pills because it's better than injecting. It's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. I don't expect you to completely understand what that is. We're still not exactly sure how they work, but they um, affect the immune system and fibrosis. And the idea is if you take this pill and you have lung disease, maybe your lung disease will not progress as fast and it might even get better. And so we're looking for patients with interstitial lung disease and um, usually within five years of the diagnosis and we want to treat them or not treat them. This is, um, we, this is an area we must get better at treating. This trial is open soon, but not quite yet. We're so close, so close. And uh, Dr. Sandorfi is leading from rheumatology and Dr. Rossman from pulmonary. Again, right next door. Not, and they could even see the patients on the same day. Uh, Dr. Uh, Rennie Ree uh, is working with me and especially with Dr. Kaywood. Dr. Kaywood leads a research group that has been able to get data from 12, I think we're up to 15. How many? Uh, 
a lot, a lot, of, a lot of trials, data from a lot of trials from the FDA. So you take all of these patients, now th hundreds and thousands of patients, and put all their data together, you can get a lot more information out of it. So this is data from trials and analyzing the merger of all those data. And Dr. Rhee, uh, working with Dr. Kaywood and others, have been able to understand better what treatments are effective and not uh, for scleroderma versus patients who don't have scleroderma and the same problem, what the safety implications are, and now doing some new analyses. And this is really actually already having an impact on how people think about the disease and designing trials. And so this is exciting work that's uh, being done uh, here at Penn. Uh, we also have um, a wide variety of studies in pulmonary arterial hypertension. I don't know if Steve's going to talk about the research so much as what you do, but there's a lot of stuff, so I won't get too on. I told you about this. There's the Pharos Registry Dr. Dirk is doing, following patients over time, and multiple different types of analyses and drug studies for people with pulmonary arterial hypertension. I think this is one area where we've seen a lot of progress uh, in terms of treatment. Uh, you know, when I started doing seeing patients with scleroderma, we had exactly zero effective treatments for pulmonary arterial hypertension. I think we're improving people's lives on our ability to treat, but we can do better and we want to continue to do better. What about the vascular disease, the Raynaud's phenomenon, digital ulcers, annoying, painful, difficult problems, sometimes very severe? Um, I'm happy to say that one week ago, this paper was published uh, in the Journal of the American Medical Association. I was part of the lead group that created the study. Unfortunately, this study, which some of you may have been part of, was looking at a drug to dilate the vessels in the hands, was not successful. It did not show. And you can say, well, that's terrible. It is unfortunate it was negative. But it also shows the interest. This was a very large series of studies being done by a company investing many, many millions of dollars in scleroderm research. And we continue actually to call with them, our research team, this week, and we continue to analyze the data to learn more. This shows you that there's real interest in doing this. So studies that, that are negative are disappointing, but they're actually important because then you know, okay, we won't use that drug. We'll go on to something else. And so this was uh, this. the idea that there would have been two studies with two to 300 people in it around the world studying scleroderma when I started, you know, it was, was, was just unbelievable that it could happen. And so it's happening now, and I think it's because patients are incredibly willing to be part of it, and the scleroderma researchers work together. And then we have a series of studies on genetics and biomarkers and other. So we have a study that's still recruiting, which is the GRASP study, which is genome research in African-American scleroderma patients. So it's a really good study, and it's a really good abbreviation. Um, so uh, you have to have a good abbreviation. Um, so patients with African-American patients um, get scleroderma, and they, get, they may even get worse scleroderma as a group. And we need to understand why is that. Um, and we, it's also a group of patients that are often not studied as much for a variety of reasons in society, and we think that's wrong. And so there's a national group that is coming together, led by money from the NIH, to uh, collect DNA from African-American patients with scleroderma and uh, study their genes, obviously well individually, but as a group, and understand better about the disease. And so this is going on nationally. We've collected patients. Um, it's a single blood draw, and we take some information down about your disease, and that's it. And it's anonymous, of course, so nobody knows who, we know who you are, but nobody knows who you are when we send the blood out. Um, this, is, uh, this is actually started, I shouldn't say nearly, we're going. And if any of you have interest who would qualify, if you're African American, please contact any of us afterwards, and we're happy to give you information about how you can participate. It, is a, it takes about an hour. You come in, we draw blood, we get some information, and that's it. But it's a very important study. We're also about to start a study, hopefully soon, we've been working on getting this going, called the SCAR study. I'm not a big fan of that abbreviation per se, but <laughs> um, it's to collect blood and skin samples and information and follow people over time and to learn how can we learn more about what causes this disease to get worse, get better, learn the, the science behind the disease, the genetics, the other things, and try to understand better how to treat this disease. And so this is really trying to enroll patients across um, the country in different centers. It's sponsored by the National Institutes of Health. It's an important study. It's not a treatment trial, but it's collecting specimens. And I I've talked to a few of you that we, we'd like to get this going. There's, it's a difficult study to get up and running for a variety of logistic reasons. And finally, we do a series of projects to understand how people do long term and how to study them. Um, I was part of a group called the CRIS group, which, has, which only took us eight years. But we eventually put together a new 
way to measure disease, overall disease. And actually, that I won't show you the pictures, but it was just published um, a few months ago. And this is now a endorsed both in Europe and the U.S. as a method for studying disease overall and is now going to be used in clinical trials. It's an index. It combines a variety of other measures and it says this is what it means to get better, this was not. Having these kinds of rules and tools, very important when you do trials in scleroderma. And so we were happy to be part of that. Uh, and then, as I said, we're looking at biomarkers. So there is more research being conducted in scleroderma, not just at Penn, but anywhere now than ever before. This is great. The, the, the amount of work being done in scleroderma is, is, I think, phenomenal in many ways. We need to continue to push. We need successes. Nothing gets more success like success. But we have shown companies and the funding agencies and the government that we can get research done. And I think it is impossible to thank our patients enough because it is because patients with scleroderma are very dedicated to working with us to get research going. I, I think our patients are tremendous in terms of what they will volunteer and be part of. Um, so we thank you for that. And I think it's, I, I'd like to say we have cautious optimism. Clearly, we haven't cured this disease yet, but we get better treatments. And I think with this research, we'll do better. How can you find out reliable information? Well, you can talk to us. We're pretty reliable. But you can also, um, well, most of us. And so, uh, we have question marks. yeah, um, you can go to this organization, the Scleroderma Foundation, list trials and keep it up to date. And it's uh, an important place to go. The other place you can go is clinicaltrials.gov. And you can enter. Now, this can be a little dizzying because if you enter uh, um, nenetidib, the new drug, you're going to get a zillion studies for all sorts of diseases. If you enter scleroderma, you're going to get stuff. It's a little confusing. Some are open, some are closed, some are in, you know, France, and you can't go. Well, it would be nice to go, but you probably can't go every month there to be part of the study. But you can sort it out, and you can find things, and you can even do scleroderma and lung or something like that. And so that listed. Actually, all trials have to be listed here. That's for trials. That's not necessarily for the kind of research where you volunteer and give blood and stuff. So I think between those, talking to us, you'll be able to find out what's going on. So I just want to mention that it, uh, it takes a village to uh, get things done in a comprehensive fashion. And we have a lot of different people. This is really not doing justice to all the people at the center who do it. But this is where, whether it's here or anywhere, you want to be at a center that can actually take care of all parts of your disease and think about it. We have a group of rheumatologists I listed here. Colin Ligon is a new person who's going to be joining us from Johns Hopkins in a few weeks. Um, a whole group of pulmonologists who do interstitial lung disease and pulmonary arterial hypertension. We have some GI doctors who are specializing in the upper GI problem, believe it or not, and we, they're happy to see us. We've got dedicated nurses and research coordinators. Some of our research people are actually out here and have been here and have been uh, terrific. Jackie Thomas is here and Ronnie DeVassi and Matt McDonald, who I really want to thank for doing a great job of putting this program together with Fee and uh, keeping us, he's texting me this morning, he's texting me last night, it's like he's, he's keeping me going. And so, um, and other collaborators in other departments. So I'm gonna end there. I think I, I could take one or two questions, but I think we wanna keep moving. So thank you very much. So that's a good question. The question was, uh, if when you, in, this, in the genetic study of African Americans, are you comparing it? So, um, well, you can compare. So there's two, two comparisons of importance. Our patients, African American patients with scleroderma versus African American patients who don't have scleroderma, because what's the difference? Or within the group, uh, those who have lung disease versus those who have no lung disease, and also between different uh, genetic groups, such as African Americans versus Caucasians. I got to tell you, race is a complicated issue in many ways, but especially genetically, we're all a mix. We can think we're whatever, we're all a mix of things, especially in the United States, and that's, I think, good. Uh, it's a richness of the nation, but it also gets complicated from an analysis standpoint. But the, the mathematics, can, you can sort it out. You can sort it out. And there are a lot of data on Caucasian Americans you can compare it to. We need more data on African Americans, otherwise they're not representatives. We need to be able to do that. And so it's a good question, but it's... I, like all questions, it asks, it asks more questions. Okay, I think we're going to move on, and I think, are you the next speaker? So Nora Sandorfi, many of you know Dr. Sandorfi, who uh, is a expert, uh, nationally known expert in scleroderma, uh, a wonderful investigator and uh, clinician, 
sees a lot of patients and um, has been doing work in trials and other aspects of the disease for many years. And she's going to talk about emerging therapies in scleroderma. Well, I want to thank uh, Dr. Marco for the introduction and also for not saying my name incorrectly. I, it's an endless jokes between Dr. Dirk and me. My famous uh, alter name is Sam Dorfy, so, <laughs> which I used for a long time, and my kids told me that I can't possibly, possibly have a Facebook account. So I did have a Facebook account, and I called myself Sam Dorfy. So, you know, sure enough, nobody found me, so that was perfectly enough. Uh, for <laughs> So and then we have a couple of stories about Dr. Dirk and his name being altered a little bit. Anyways, um, so um, it's kind of interesting. Dr. Merkel's talk is a little bit in you know overlap with my talk, emerging therapies. Clearly, you know we are. I'm going to talk about a couple of those uh, uh, drugs or studies that he has talked about, not necessarily repeating the information he has said, um, and then some other therapies. So you know when you um, look for treatment, right? Especially in in scleroderma. I just want to know how to how to advance. How am I advancing? The arrows on the side. Oh, okay. Okay. So when you think about systemic sclerosis, and I'm not going to go into the basics, right? But it's important to know that we have three major areas, right? The immunology part of it, which is the we always, I mean, when I see my patients, I always tell them, you know, the white cells, the fighting cells, the this cells, that cells. But that's really what gives the immune part of it, immunology, your immune system, how it's, because we believe that these, these diseases are immune, autoimmune diseases. So they have to, have to do with this immune reactions not working properly, right? So you look in that area. The other important part of this disease is the fibrosis part of it, right? So fibrosis is the thickening, thickening of the skin, thickening of the lungs, thickening of the, of the heart, all the tissues, right? And then the third part of it is the vascular, the vessels, how the vessels change in scleroderma. See, these are the three main areas that we usually investigate and focus on. Now, when you are developing new therapies, um, you really have to know what the problem is. So the reason why, I guess, the reason is why we can't find that one good drug for scleroderma or for any of these autoimmune diseases is that it's not that easy, right? It's not one singular problem. You have strep throat, you give the antibiotics, strep throat is gone. While scleroderma and the autoimmune diseases are not so easy and not so simple, if you wish. So any one of those little uh, uh, changes, chemicals, we call them growth factors, cytokines, the cells, how they behave, the skin cells, how they behave, the cells that are inside the lungs and heart, how, why they become what they become, why they produce those proteins and those materials that are inappropriately overproduced in scleroderma, and what exactly happens with the inside of the vessels uh, that uh, Dr. Kaywood is going to talk about, the, uh, the, that, that eventually leads to pulmonary hypertension. So all of these areas are somewhat separate but still overlaying, so they have to do with each other. So the researchers who are sitting at the bench or standing at the bench, which I actually did for three years, two years, it's very complicated, very, very complicated uh, uh, process. They're trying to tease it out, find out where exactly that problem is. And once we find something, hey, I think that this particular cell is behaving this way because the genes are not working properly. What can we do about that? How can we affect that particular gene or whatever that may be and then develop a drug? So it's an extremely long process. And not only that, but then we have to look at, um, you know, races, different patients, different forms of scleroderma. So it gets very complicated. So therefore, the therapies that are emerging are affecting and directed towards different targets. These little parts that the investigators, basic researchers, find and then try to act on. Did I, was this clear? Okay, good. So, um, so the main areas, again, are that we are trying to work on, because you can't work on every single little thing. And then what I'm going to talk about is skin and the lungs. So um, 
why is that? Because when you are investigating a medication or a particular uh, therapy, you want to have enough changes, you want to have enough patience, you want to have your power, as we say it. So when you make a change, when you give a drug, you have enough changes that you can follow and then conclude from that. So the main areas, as I said, skin and lungs. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to go through these medications um, and these different drugs and different therapies, and I'll just give you a little background. It's not going to be down to the dirty basics because we don't have time and I don't have the enough knowledge, but hopefully at least you see how many different um, approaches um, we have at this point. So, um, you know, we don't always want to reinvent the wheel. When we have a medication that has been used, either in other autoimmune diseases where we find similarities, or we have a medication that we have used in, for example, in scleroderma or, or complications of scleroderma, we want to say, well, because these things are overlaying, uh, maybe that drug that worked for, I don't know, pulmonary hypertension, maybe it's going to work for the skin, maybe it's going to work for the vessel part of the disease, maybe it's going to work for the lungs. So what we do is we try to kind of take that drug and then try to apply it for different aspects of the disease. So that's why you see many medications on the left, uh, on the left hand side that may sound familiar uh, on their skin. Um, and uh, you know, some of them are being used in scleroderma, some of them are being used in, for example, rheumatoid arthritis. And then when you look on the, uh, on the other hand, on the right hand side, um, when you investigate lungs, um, we have, again, other medications that we have used, for example, in other forms of lung conditions. So let's jump into it. So we call them endothelial receptor blockers, right? These are medications that work on cells that are inside the vessel wall, all right? So the, the two that I'm going to mention here is Bosentin, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that, take clear. Um, and mesitentin, which is a newer form of the, of the same medication. So we use these drugs for pulmonary hypertension. Now, I'm not going to spend any time on this, but I want to tell you that, that there was a thought that it's possible that these drugs may actually have, and mainly um, it was both sent, and mainly this drug has an effect on skin. Maybe it's actually going to help us with the skin changes in, in scleroderma. So you studies the European... Um, um, uh, what is it, society, society for, for scleroderma. So those people in Europe, uh, those, uh, those uh, rheumatologists and scleroderma specialists took 75 patients with skin changes, diffuse scleroderma, and they compared it with 900 plus patients. And unfortunately, they found that there was no, this medication, this drug had no effect on skin changes. So again, this was a negative study. Uh, but again, you know, you don't want to treat anecdotally. Just because one person took it and the skin got better, you don't want to conclude. You want to have clear data. So this drug does not seem to be working on skin. <coughs> However, uh, and when they looked at uh, on lungs, whether it works for lung fibrosis, it also was a negative study. So this drug does not seem to be having much effect on this fibrotic, on this thickening part of the condition. However, we do know that this drug actually is capable of preventing new ulcerations from happening um, on the fingertips that is due to Raynaud's phenomenon, okay? So <clears throat> the dual study that Dr. Merkel just talked about, it's freshly out of the print, um, included 500 patients, 16 weeks of therapy of the medication at two different doses. And this drug, however, had no effect on ulcer uh, prevention from ulcer formation. So uh, now we have an interesting data here. We see that the one for, form of the drug actually works to prevent ulcers from happening, works on pulmonary hypertension, doesn't work on skin. And then mesitentin, the new drug, doesn't have an effect on ulcer formation. So tocilizumab, this is a medication we use in rheumatoid arthritis. It's an IL-6 inhibitor, again, we're not going to go into uh, a, a deep explanation of what IL-6 is. It's a cytokine, it's an inflammatory cytokine. This drug works really well for uh, rheumatoid arthritis, for example, and many other emerging uh, areas. Uh, I was actually part of this study. I had two patients enrolled um, while I was in a different institution. Um, that study took 87 patients 
they were treated. It's an injectable medication for 24 weeks. And a, uh, the primary outcome of the study was um, treatment of skin thickening. So there were some exploratory points. So it also looked at lung function, fatigue, disabilities, itching, patient and physician global assessment on the, on, on, on the disease. So the results were not as good as we expected it to be. So unfortunately, there was, no, there was change in the skin thickening in these patients. However, it wasn't statistically significant. So this, this, this is the key word, statistically significant. Just because you see a little bit of a change, it has to reach this statistical uh, relevance. And unfortunately, the study did not show that. However, it pointed towards a good trend. And it was good enough that they are actually uh, proposing a phase three trial, which means that they're going to extend the study and they're going to involve more patients and probably enhance the, the strength of the study towards the skin, skin improvement. So while the skin, improve, uh, skin did not change significantly, they felt that um, there was a, a little bit of an effect on lung changes, but that was exploratory. So we say that wasn't the main focus of the study. But I did see that there was a little bit of a change in breathing capacity, how you take breath, uh, uh, the one big breath and then the one big breath. You guys do this all the time. I only did it once in, when I was in medical school. That was the last and the first. I was so dizzy. Every time I give you the uh, script to get the pulmonary function test, then I'm thinking, well, oh my goodness, I hope, you know, uh, what you have to go through. Anyways, the rest of the parameters were not um, uh, different from the uh, control group. So rituximab. <clears throat> so this is also a widely used medication in rheumatology. We use it for rheumatoid arthritis, somewhat lupus. So it is a different kind of approach. It actually affects B cells. So it has to do with the immune part of the condition. B cells are one of those fighting cells. And they are big, 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 big manipulators of inflammatory and autoimmune uh, diseases. So now, I actually find this to be very interesting, this study. So what they did was they, we recognized that if you take the serum, which is like the fluidy part of the blood, right? Not the red part of it, but like, you know, when you cut yourself and this little yellowish thing comes out, that's the serum, okay? So when they take serum from patients with scleroderma, they find that there is, uh, they can actually turn on, whatever is in the serum can turn on normal skin cells to become more active and produce collagen, okay, which is one of the big problems in this disease. So there must be some sort of a factor, right, in the blood, in the scleroderma patient's blood, that actually can, can turn on normal skin cells and uh, other uh, cells that, that may produce these, these, these uh, thickening uh, proteins. So this, this was a... Uh, pilot study, they took six patients who had severe skin involvement and they were not responsive to, to tried therapies. Um, what they did was uh, that they measured some of these factors um, and the skin cell activity uh, in these patients uh, uh, following um, rituximab therapy. And they felt that there was a significant reduction in these activity, the activity of the skin cells, and also they found that this PDGF, which is a growth factor, was also lessened in the patient's case. They also felt that there was uh, improvement in the skin thickening. So this, was a, this is an encouraging study. So they, th there is discussion about this medication being used in a larger trial when you can compare treated patients with control patients. So Rezunab. So when I was preparing for this talk, I asked my son yesterday, I said, dude, this is how I talk, dude, <laughs> how do you pronounce the first word? And he said, I am ashamed on the family because I can't pronounce cannabinoid. Did I say it right? Wow. Okay. So endocannabinoids. He said, mom, you can't embarrass us. He said, all right, I'll try not to embarrass you. <laughs> so we practice cannabinoid. I know I still can say can cannabinoid. All right. So cannabinoids, I'm sure everybody knows what they are. So these are proteins, right? This is a very interesting concept. Endocannabinoids are cannabinoids that are being, we make them. 
Okay, so it's not coming from the plant. We are actually make. I'm not sure everybody does know, so you might want to explain what they are. Oh, please, everybody knows. Uh, They're coming from, it, it's part of marijuana. So it's, it's can, cannabinoids are, are coming from, the plant form of it is coming from, coming from uh, marijuana. So, so they can actually have, we have two different, what I'm going to talk about is two different, we call them receptors or, or areas where the, these, pro, these, uh, these pro, uh, factors can work. So there's the CB1 receptors and the CB2 receptors. So we're going to concentrate on the CB2 receptors because they are actually on immune cells and some, some, there, there are some of these receptors on fibroblasts, okay, which is the skin cell. So the idea is that by making these chemicals that resemble to the, to the cannabinoid that is being produced inside us, okay, you can actually maybe alter the immune reactions and also the skin cells, right? So that's what the first two words mean, endocannabinoid, mimetic, which means looks like mimics its activity, synthetic drug, so it's being made in the uh, laboratory setting, okay? So um, uh, it, it's, this study is in phase two, which means that they're trying different dosages in patients, right? It's open label. Uh, it's going to have an open label part to it, which means that you know everybody's going to get a drug. In other words, there's no placebo drug here, and uh, they will use the drug. They're using the dr drug for for a couple of months. So when they're looking at uh, skin scores, and they are also looking at lung function. So this is going to affect immune and also the fibroblast or the cells that are producing the. Uh, the extracellular uh, proteins. It also will look at disability and global health um, in terms of how the patients feel, because that's also important, not only how well the skin looks, right? Also important how fatigued we are and so forth. So I don't have data on it. It's in process, but it's a very interesting concept. And to be honest with you, patients always ask me about that, you know? So what about the medical marijuana? And I don't know yet, we'll see what happens, okay? <clears throat> so this is the, the study that we talked about. They take the fat tissue. By the way, I want to tell you that it's really, really interesting that those two patients who we have in the study, one is my patient, one is Dr. Dirk's patient, both of them are runners with the, uh, uh, their body mass index in a very low range. So they both had to give up actually running and pack fat on so they could take the fat out and then use it for the study. I mean, what, what are the odds, right? <laughs> What are the odds? So I actually looked at them, both of them, before they, they undergone the surgery, you know, when they take the fat out. And the girl, she said, you know, my boyfriend is standing me. I'm getting a little plump here. And, and she said, look, look, look. I said, it's going to be gone, OK? And the same thing happened with, uh, with the other patient who was just enrolled. He was showing me his, he says, look at this. Look at what I got here. So um, I, <laughs> It is a very interesting concept. A lot of, you know, they take the fat tissue out, they take these cells, they inject it. Now, so what I'm going to say. How long did that boyfriend last? <laughs> <laughs> They've been together for a long time. So I was like, hopefully, hopefully that's going to last. So um, this is actually originating from France. And the, 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 the original study didn't only include the hands, and it was actually for a couple of years they were doing these, these, these injections, but also involved the face. Uh, skin, and, and in addition to the hand changes, they also felt that the patients had more mouth opening. It helped with the, uh, with the jaw joint and also helped with the skin. So we'll see what happens with this because that may be an interesting concept. It's a little labor intensive, if you wish, but, but the idea is, is very promising. All right. So when I was in medical school, I had really strong doubts that I will ever pass uh, you know, all my exams because these words, nilotinib, isotinib, lidimid, it's impossible to remember them. So you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you guys are looking at another odd name. Nilotinib. Um, this is an open label uh, trial. This is also a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, similar to the nintadinib that Dr. Merkel was talking about, where these are the, uh, also factors that, that work through the immune system. 
Um, it actually affects um, TGF beta, which is a growth factor that we have recognized in, in scleroderma uh, for a long time now. And it also works on this platelet derived growth factor, which I have mentioned when I was talking about the toximab. So these are factors in the blood that cause growth in whether it's um, fib fib fibrotic tissue growth or cell growth. So they, in other words, they are stimulatory factors, right? So this study is supposed to interfere with the activity of these, of these factors, of these growth factors. In other words, it should dampen the disease, right? So um, they had, this is also in prelim prelim preliminary phase, they took 10 patients who took the medication for six or uh, 12 months. Unfortunately, three patients discontinued the study because of um, changes in their EKG. But we have seen this before. This is not an unusual thing that certain medications can interfere with how the conduction is happening within the cell, within the heart, I'm sorry. Um, but they've seen pretty significant improvement in their skin and also in the level of these growth factors. So this is something that, again, may move into a different phase of, of the research. So then we have the gene therapy. So this is also very interesting. So this FX, FCX103, um, the FDA actually speeded this tri trial up because it made, the, made, the, made this uh, uh, treatment approach, we call it orphan drug, which means that they are, they're letting the companies go a little uh, faster with the, with the studies. So these FCX113 uh, 113 are modified skin cells, right? So what they do is they put these, as you see the blue, the blue segment, they put, put this different um, uh, uh, structure or, or gene within the, within the, the uh, skin cells. And then what they do is they put it back into, put it into the patient, hoping that these modified skin cells will help the other skin cells to behave a little better, okay? Interesting approach, very interesting approach, right? So there are preclinical uh, studies. Of, of course, the preclinical -clin, pre studies are always animal studies. So we have these animal models for scleroderma, and these, were, these are the ones that were used, and they were very uh, promising. So they're, starting, they're planning on starting the first human studies in 2017, which is next year, okay? You can always interrupt me if the concept is not entirely clear, okay? All right, ifetroben, new fascinating name. This is also a, uh, a therapy that's going to affect the, the thickening, the skin thickening. It's an, a capsule, as Dr. Merkel mentioned, we always like capsules when you don't have to inject. Um, it, um, it is going to look at patients with, scleroderma, with diffuse scleroderma and scleroderma-associated pulmonary artery hypertension. I'm not going to go into the thromboxane prostonated receptor um, uh, mechanism, but uh, these are, as, as you see, are, uh, again, we're working with, with um, vascular cells, smooth muscle cells that has, have to do with, um, with the lung changes and the vessel changes within the lung. Now, these, this particular drug has actually, you look at the name, vasculin, which means vessels, right? It has actually showed efficacy we call it vasospasm, which means how, how much the vessels actually constrict. So it relaxes them. And they actually have been proven to help with, with um, uh, in, in patients who had some sort of a heart event, meaning the vessels constricted and, the, and there was some sort of a heart injury due to vessel constriction. So it helps with that particular part of the, of the condition. It actually seemed to help with cardiac uh, fibrosis, which means that the heart muscle thickening, so that is aiming uh, to address this particular problem. So uh, needless to say, it's going to look at the skin improvement because it has to do with fibrosis, right? It's going to look at pulmonary arteria hypertension, which is the third big part of the, uh, of the, of the disease, and also heart muscle stiffening. So this is very, in it's a very interesting approach. I'm, um, uh, I was uh, very intrigued when I was reading about it. So that's what I have to say about the skin. There's a little overlap to other areas, but mainly uh, when we look at the, the emerging therapies for skin. So lungs. 
Two very well-known medications, I um, want to say probably to all of you, cyclophosphamide and mycophenolate. Morphetil, we call it the cell set, right? Cyclophosphamide is this <coughs> cytoxin, right? One is an intravenous therapy, the other one is an oral therapy. And I, lo I look at many of you, I know that many of you have, have tried it or is doing it at this point. So cyclophosphamide has been, uh, it actually has an oral form of it too, has been studied for a long time for scleroderma. We have a, a couple of studies that have shown um, possible benefit of this drug uh, small, imp small improvement in one of the lung fu function tests. However, the problem with that was that it was only transient, meaning it didn't last. So the idea was that, you know, maybe if you follow this intravenous oral, oral therapy with salsep mycophenolate, maybe we can prolong the effect of the, of the, uh, uh, the first phase of the therapy. So um, in France, uh, scientists took uh, uh, physicians took um, 20 patients, six, uh, they were exposed to either six or 12 intravenous uh, cyclophosphamide treatment. It's once a month, so it's either six months or 12 months, okay? And they followed it up with either six, uh, six months or more um, mycophenolate, which is the salsa therapy. So in other words, you introduce an intravenous therapy, you do it either for six months or 12 months, and you follow it with an oral therapy salsa, right? So um, without going through every one of these details, it appears that the patients who had the longer intravenous therapy, meaning up to 12 months, followed by the um, cell sept therapy were doing the best. Um, the 50% of them showed some improvement and stability, 50% of them progressed. So this is something that we have actually been different uh, combinations we've been also doing without having a, a, a real study in the background showing the efficacy, but this is one of the approaches that we have uh, currently been actually using, and this is the study behind it um, that is supportive of possible um, uh, positive benefit of this particular uh, combination therapy. Nintadanib, we talked about, Dr. Merkel has talked about it. This is a study that hopefully will open up very soon. At Penn, we are already looking at patients who belong to the pulmonary uh, uh, doctors. Um, uh, what I wanted to mention about this medication is that um, uh, I think you guys are familiar with it. I'm not going to say much about that. Um, there is another uh, treatment. It's a monoclonal antibody, which just means how, um, how comparable it is to, to human. It's called a CM101. It doesn't even have a name yet. Uh, it's been in trial for lung fibrosis. Uh, it's coming from Israel and Italy. Um, this particular drug blocks another factor uh, in, the, in, 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 the, uh, in patients uh, that has been found to be higher amount in scleroderma patients. And um, in the pre-phase studies, when you look at, again, animal models, it seemed to control the uh, fibroblast, which is the skin uh, cell, and some immune cell migrations. So this is a very interesting concept. It's an injectable medication, going to be an injectable medication, and is it's going to uh, be studied in lung disease. And that's what I have for you. So a lot of information. Any questions? Probably I can take half a question, I guess. Because <laughs> Dr. Merkel was already going like that. Yes. Anybody, that's, uh, is that something that the body has anyway? Or it, it, it makes on account of some antigen or what? Yeah, so antibody just means it's an antibody against it's not an, an anti antibody. No, Excuse it's me? That, oh, it's not an auto no, 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 it's just a concept. It's not, it's not an autoantibody, it's a concept against an antibody, that's what the antibody, uh, an antigen, as you, as you mentioned it.
So you have, you have something that you would like to knock out. That's what it means. Oh. So you're creating... The body doesn't make this or won't make it on account of something in the counter? It's a whole hour of lecture, what you just asked me. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> We created mouth okay. with, with, with scleroderma like changes. It's never perfect. Never perfect. So they are created. We, um, one of them is the tight skin mouse, which actually my, my old mentor, Dr. Jimenez's lab had and then created. It's, it's a mouse that has a very skin thick, thick skin. Right. But do, there are some. Hmm? Uh, you know, these are like they cross, 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 cross these, these, these animals until they get to that particular, uh, we call it phenotype, particular look to the, to the mass. All right. Somebody else? No. Yes. These studies, is there a criteria for how much time the scleroderma patient had from the scleroderma? Yes, it's very important that you find the right patients for, for studies. You don't, you, unfortunately, you always want to find patients who are, we call them active, ongoing, because otherwise, you know, what are you measuring? You don't know what, what you're measuring. There are all set of criteria, which I actually didn't talk about, but there are some studies that actually look at patients who are the best candidates for studies. So uh, study for everything, you know, but it has to be done in the right way. Otherwise, we don't have right information. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. We're running about 20 to 25 minutes late, so we have a break built in after Dr. Kamu. However, sure. we can swap it and do the break now if you want. Um, should, we keep, to, should we keep going or just yeah, keep, going. keep going? Keep going. All right. That's the spirit. Uh, so Stephen Kawut, um, I'm uh, glad to introduce Steve. He's been collaborator for several years in our as we work together in scleroderma, as you've heard, Steve is an internationally recognized leader in research in pulmonary arterial hypertension, which I'm pretty sure he's going to explain what that is, and uh, conducts uh, research with large data, research in clinical trials, talks about and sees patients here at Penn in this, and is a member of the pulmonary division here at the University of Pennsylvania, an associate professor, and we're glad he's joining us. Thank you, Peter. It's a real uh, honor and pleasure to speak today, and uh, thanks for inviting me to this uh, really nice uh, meeting. Uh, so first, let's get some definitions out of the way. What is pulmonary hypertension? Um, I've heard of regular high blood pressure, regular hypertension. I've got lots of friends who have that. But what is pulmonary hypertension? So most simply, uh, pulmonary hypertension is high blood pressure in the lungs. And so I should answer the first question, yes, you can get high blood pressure in the lungs. That's always the first question. And it's really very different from the other sort of high blood pressure. This is like the other white meat. Uh, it's different in how, what causes it. Um, it's different in symptoms. For example, uh, scleroderma is a very clear cause of pulmonary hypertension, high blood pressure in the, in the lungs, um, whereas regular high blood pressure tends to not have a known cause. Most people who have regular high blood pressure, there's no specific disease that's causing it, they just have high blood pressure. And so, again, there are a variety of things that can cause pulmonary hypertension, scleroderma being one of them. The symptoms of pulmonary hypertension are also different than the symptoms of regular hypertension. Uh, most people with regular hypertension, there are probably people in this room, don't have any symptoms. High blood pressure doesn't necessarily cause lots of symptoms. On the other hand, uh, high blood pressure in the lungs does cause symptoms. It makes you short of breath. It can give you chest pain. It can make your legs swell. It makes it hard to do activity. This is all very different than regular high blood pressure. Uh, as I mentioned, there are very clear links to systemic sclerosis and scleroderma. Um, around 10 to 15 percent of patients with scleroderma will develop uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension. Um, and I will say that uh, we have to be careful because there's actually net many different forms of pulmonary hypertension. Again, unlike regular hypertension, where there's really one basic form, pulmonary hypertension comes in a variety of flavors. Um, 
And it's really important to figure out if you have pulmonary hypertension, what flavor of pulmonary hypertension you have, because the treatments are very different and the implications to you are very different. Uh, and we'll talk about that more in a second. Finally, uh, pulmonary hypertension really has had many victories. There are 14 treatments for at least one form of pulmonary hypertension, 14 different drugs. Um, I would hazard to say that that schools other uh, diseases in pulmonary. That's many more than COPD or uh, even asthma necessarily, um, and may even rival uh, other rheumatologic diseases, because I can't think of a rheumatologic disease that has 14 different treatments. Yeah, yes, sir. All right, other than rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so, uh, you know, if there's good news about pulmonary hypertension, it's better to have it now than 15 years ago when we had no treatments. And I tell my patients that. I say, well, you know, gosh, you are lucky because you are developing this now when we have all these drugs. And if you'd come to me in 1998, I would have none of these drugs when I was a fellow. So there, there's a silver lining here, and, and we'll talk more about that. So uh, why is this such a problem? Um, well, high blood pressure in the lungs um, can put a stress on the heart, uh, particularly the right side of the heart. Remember that the right side of the heart pumps the blood to the lungs. So when there's a problem in the lungs, it backs up into the right side of the heart. And I compare this to the Lincoln Tunnel. Anybody ever driven into New York City through the Lincoln or the Holland Tunnel? When something happens in the Lincoln Tunnel, what happens? Backs up to Jersey. And think of the right side of the heart as Jersey. So when there's a narrowing or an obstruction in the tunnels and the vessels of the lung, bad stuff happens backwards, back into Jersey, back into uh, th those cities. And that's exactly what pulmonary hypertension is all about. It's an obstruction in the lungs, which causes problems on the right side of the heart, causes your legs to swell, um, uh, and makes it short of breath. And of course, it makes it harder for the heart to pump blood to the body. You have to get blood through your lungs in order to get to the left side of your heart to perfuse your arms and your legs and your brain. And so when you have an obstruction in the lungs, your heart can't pump blood to the rest of your body. So it's, it's really a problem. And I mentioned this causes shortness of breath, um, swelling in the legs, and, and feeling tired. Uh, as I mentioned before, there are a variety of different kinds of pulmonary hypertension. There's different kinds of high blood pressure in the lungs. And specifically, there's really three main kinds of pulmonary hypertension in scleroderma. The first kind is uh, due to scarring of the lungs. So lots of patients with scleroderma will get interstitial fibrosis or interstitial lung disease, scarring of the lungs, just like you have scarring in the tissues. This can cause destruction of the vessels. Think about if the Lincoln Tunnel caved in and causes pulmonary hypertension, just because the vessels are destroyed by fibrosis. There's a second kind um, that's due to the stiffness and fibrosis of the left side of the heart. So I mentioned that the, uh, the problem is high blood pressure in the lungs, but if there's a problem in the left side of the heart, and the heart can get fibrotic as well in scleroderma, that can back up into the lungs, that can back up into the right side of the heart, and also give you the same uh, sort of symptoms. And then the third kind, um, this is probably the most treatable kind, is really due to the narrowing of the vessels themselves. So the vessels get disease in them and they get smaller. Again, just like if we were to make the Holland or Lincoln Tunnel smaller, it's harder for the cars to get through. You wouldn't have two lanes, you would have one lane. And that causes traffic. Um, and we call that pulmonary arterial hypertension. So how do I tell what kind, whether you have pulmonary hypertension and what kind it is? Well, I talk to you, first of all. Um, are you having symptoms? Are you having shorter breath? Now, of course, lots of patients with scleroderma have shortness of breath. That doesn't mean that you necessarily have pulmonary hypertension. Shortness of breath is a very common symptom and also very nonspecific. Lots of things can cause shortness of breath. Then I examine you. I do a physical exam. I look at your neck. Um, there's a little fuel gauge in your neck that you don't know about that tells me how full things are inside. It tells me how the heart's working. And so whenever I see a patient in my office, I spend a lot of time looking at their neck. And the patients get very weirded out by that because they don't know what I'm looking at. Um, 
We also do testing. Um, so pulmonary function tests, many of you in the room have probably had those. Uh, these are tests where the, you blow into a big machine um, or you sit in a box and you breathe. Doesn't hurt. Um, often the tech will yell at you because they want you to blow really hard. Um, so that can be scary because the tech is screaming at you to blow. Um, uh, but measures the size of your lungs and how they transport oxygen. And it doesn't hurt. It's not uncomfortable. Um, the other test that's really useful is an echocardiography. This is an ultrasound of the heart. Um, this can estimate the level of blood pressure in the lungs. Now, mind you, it says estimate, not measure. So this is an ultrasound, and so it's a little bit of a guess. It's not a perfect measurement. It can also uh, look for hints as to what kind of pulmonary hypertension you have, if it looks like you have it. And it can look at other parts of your heart to see how those parts are functioning as well. Scleroderma can affect the heart just like it affects the lungs and the skin, and so uh, echo can help tease that out a bit. We can also look at your lungs. Uh, so using a chest x-ray, but more commonly a CAT scan of your lungs, can show whether you have lung disease, so whether you have fibrosis of the lungs or scarring, or emphysema. Uh, remember that for people in the room who used to smoke, uh, you know, just because you have scleroderma doesn't mean you can't get other lung diseases, unfortunately, and so you can certainly get both fibrosis and emphysema, and a CAT scan is a good way to find that. And then the, the ultimate test and the last test, if we think you have pulmonary hypertension, to figure out what kind it is, is the right heart catheterization. So this is a heart catheterization a bit similar to uh, other sorts of heart catheterizations. It does not involve dye. It involves putting a catheter either through the neck or through the groin, actually into the heart, and into the lungs to directly measure the pressure in the lungs. This is really the only test to really know if you have pulmonary hypertension, and it's the only test that confirm whether this is the pulmonary hypertension that we can use those drugs um, to treat. Um, so again, directly measures the pressure in the heart and lungs, can help tell how mild or severe the pulmonary hypertension is, if it's there at all. Sometimes we do a catheterization and we say you have no pulmonary hypertension. The other tests were wrong, and that's great news. Um, and then can determine which type of pulmonary hypertension you have. So this is obviously an invasive test. Setting the test up and the hard table are usually more uncomfortable than putting the catheter in itself. Uh, the people who do this are very, very good at it. They do this all day long. Um, so like I said, the setting up for the test probably takes an hour and a half. The test itself probably takes 10 minutes. All right, so what about treatments? As I mentioned before, there are 14 treatments approved by the FDA for the treatment of pulmonary arterial hypertension. So this was that third form of pulmonary hypertension that it can occur in scleroderma. And there's a variety of different drugs, um, and it's probably less important for you to know the names of the drugs and the fact that there are 14 different options that literally did not exist in the year 2000 uh, when I was finishing my training. Um, endothelin receptor antagonists, these are pills. PD5 inhibitors, you may know these pills as Viagra or Cialis. So these are drugs that are, work for both erectile dysfunction, all those friendly commercials between the man and the woman that you see on the TV, and they're in the separate bathtubs, and, and the ladies laying on the bed, and that's, uh, those pills actually work for pulmonary arterial hypertension. We give them different names, but the drugs are exactly the same. Uh, process like an analogs, uh, these are pills uh, or inhaled treatments or subcutaneous treatments like a, a diabetes pump for insulin or, in either, uh, or intravenous treatments. This is a pill um, and this is a, uh, the most recent pill that was just approved, which works kind of like these drugs, uh, but works in a pill form. And so, you know, I think the important thing to take away from this is, again, not to remember the names of the medicines or how they're delivered, but that there are so many different options, so many different options which didn't exist um, only a little while ago. There are other options which are really important. Um, oxygen is really important. So a lot of patients who have scleroderma have um, interstitial lung disease, and patients don't read the textbooks. They don't have just one part of what I've shown you. They can often have different parts. They can have a little bit of scarring and a little bit of pulmonary hypertension, um, so I say patients can have as many different diseases and problems as they, as they want. They don't need to pay attention to the textbook. And so oftentimes oxygen is useful for patients with 
pulmonary hypertension, and scleroderma. Now, just yesterday, I had a patient, and I hear this all the time, they didn't want to use oxygen because they didn't want to become addicted. They didn't want to be dependent on oxygen. And I said, indeed, you are dependent on oxygen like my Mazda is dependent on gas. I said, I don't drive slowly when I have an empty tank of gas to try to, you know, I put more gas in the tank so I can drive faster. So I say, yes, you are absolutely addicted to oxygen, and it would be crazy to not give you more oxygen rather than to walk around without oxygen. Um, so you do not get dependent on oxygen. Um, so think of the car analogy. Uh, we use water, um, water pills as well, Lasix. Um, probably the most important drug in patients with pulmonary hypertension. I say patients, if I needed, if I was on a desert island and I had a patient with pulmonary hypertension and I could have one drug, I would choose Lasix. Very, very effective. Uh, patients feel terrible when they have lots of fluid on board. They feel much better when fluid is taken off and these pills do that. And of course, it's important to get your vaccinations, to get a vaccination against pneumonia and against influenza every year. So in summary, uh, pulmonary hypertension can, of course, occur in scleroderma. There are several types, but this pulmonary arterial hypertension is the subtype that's very important because we've got drugs to treat it. Uh, the diagnosis requires experience um, and uh, requires experience and much experience. Uh, it's worthwhile saying it twice. Um, different treatments and then best treated by specialists. So let's talk about specialists. So. Um, in the next few slides, just an uh, unabashed plug for the Pulmonary Vascular Disease Program here at Penn. So this program was founded in 1969 by Al Fishman um, when he came to Penn. So Al Fishman is really the father of pulmonary hypertension uh, research and clinical care really in the world. Um, he was the director of the Cardiovascular Pulmonary Division. It used to be a single division combined here at Penn, which makes sense because the heart and the lungs are so close together. And as a trainee, as a fellow, he was actually involved in the Nobel Prize winning work of right heart catheterization. So the doctors who's invented right heart catheterization got the Nobel Prize for medicine. And in their speech, they actually mentioned Dr. Fishman, who was a fellow at the time. So I tell my fellows that their goal is that they need to be mentioned in a Nobel Prize speech someday. Uh, kind of sets, sets a high bar. They, they got to get out more. They got to get out more. Um, Dr. Fishman died a few years ago, um, but he trained Harold Plefsky, um, who was my mentor, and actually Dr. Fishman was my mentor when I was a trainee here in the 90s, a very impressive guy. We have a very large program. Um, we have two campuses, two clinics, one at Penn Presbyterian Hospital. Harold Plefsky is the medical director there. That's Dr. Fishman's uh, fellow mentee. Um, and then Akaya Smith is the medical director here at the University of Pennsylvania. We are a single program with two sites. Um, lots of other physicians at each program, lots of nurse practitioners. Um, we've got a very large research program, lots of research assistants and a program coordinator, and then obviously interface with others throughout the campus, specifically Rennie and Peter we've collaborated with. But of course, we also work with nurses, gastroenterologists um, in hepatology, pediatric cardiology. So it's really a very diverse program, which has existed here for you know, 50 years. Um, we have a mission of the program, and the foundation of this mission is clinical care. Uh, if we don't provide top-notch clinical care, everything else collapses. So that is the basis of our program. On that clinical care foundation, we also perform research. The only reason we have 14 drugs for pulmonary arterial hypertension are because people like you, over the past 20 years, went into clinical trials. If you don't go into clinical trials 20 years from now, we won't have another 14 medicines. And that's, I have to make that very clear, and sometimes patients don't understand that, that the reason they have treatments, the reason that people in this room may have treatments are because of the altruism of patients who came before you to go into research. Without research, there's no more advancement. Um, training and education is really important. The reason that I do what I do is because I was trained by Hal Plefsky, who was trained by Al Fishman. Um, and then, of course, community awareness, like events like this, and patient and family support, because this is a disease that doesn't just affect the patient, it really affects the entire family, the support system, the children, uh, the spouse. And so we really uh, try to provide that in our program. Um, the Pulmonary Hypertension Pulmonary Vascular Disease Program. It's a long name. And I can, I can give you information in terms of contact numbers after. 
Um, finally, uh, the Pulmonary Hypertension Association is a great resource for information. So www.phaassociation.org. And the PHA has actually started an accreditation program to designate centers of excellence for pulmonary hypertension care. Penn was one of the first centers in the country to receive this designation, and we remain the only center in the area to be a designated center of excellence for PHA care. They're called PH care centers, and so we are a center for comprehensive care. That means that we do it all, and that we have 50 years of experience in taking care of patients just with this disease. We're also part of the PHA registry. I actually head the PHA registry. This is an initiative to gather data from patients both with scleroderma and other causes of pulmonary hypertension throughout the country, over 30 centers to try to figure out what kind of things work and what don't. What are risk factors for bad outcomes and what, what works well? Um, once again, the only way to improve the care of you is for and, and people who come after you is to engage in research efforts like this. Um, that's my talk. Um, happy to, I guess, answer questions afterwards. Let's take a, one or two questions, Jan, Dr. Kaywood, otherwise we'll stay there. Okay. Okay. So the question is, what's the difference between pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary arterial hypertension? Is that correct? So pulmonary hypertension is a more general term. There are 50 kinds of pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary arterial hypertension is a specific subset of pulmonary hypertension. And it is one of the kinds of pulmonary hypertension that you can see in scleroderma. And it's this pulmonary arterial hypertension, or PAH, which uh, can be treated with these medicines. And so it's, a very, it's very important to figure out if it's that form or another form. So it's a subtype. Um, n not really, not really. Pulmonary arterial hypertension is, is really the disease. Um, there that are name. other diseases of the pulmonary arteries. Occasional inflammation causes aneurysm and brings in some very unusual diseases that we also see, but this is the main form, and certainly the main form is clear down. The only form is clear down. One more question, then we can go break, or? Sure. You mentioned that the, the, drug, the drug that's measured on the television Exactly the same. Okay, so, so my, my, my problem with that is I can get Viagra any time I want to, but my wife can't get her drug, and it costs about 20 times as much. What yeah, that? well, that, that, that's a good point. Um, so, um, and there's probably good business reasons for why pharmaceutical companies took the same drug, gave it a new name, and the price is very different. Um, well, so there's um, the PHA, and there are other have patient assistance programs. Um, often the companies themselves have patient assistance programs to cover costs that insurance doesn't cover. Um, so all of these drugs do have these patient assistance programs. And we all have uh, strong letters that we write and uh, fight for the patients. I think we... Uh, I signed any letter you want to sign. We argue with them, and we generally win, but it's, it's been a struggle. Um, so why don't we take, that's great. Uh, why don't we take a break? A couple of quick questions, uh, quick things. There are bathrooms down the hall that way, on the right and left as you go down the hall. Uh, despite the fact that our two of our physicians and our person running this brought coffee in, there actually is no uh, food in this auditorium, please. And, um, but we're a terrific role model, Dr. Dirk. And, um, you got my name right. <laughs> Yes, but don't let, don't let the pen officer see it. Um, and uh, so bathrooms, why don't we take 15 minutes and we'll call you back in, 10, 10, 10 15 minutes, and we're gonna come back in and do a question and answer session and go buy some square number foundation stuff, look at the literature, and if you're interested in some of our studies, come and talk to us, thank you.
Thank you. 